Before the election, the coalition warned household favourites like a roast dinner would become an expensive rarity under the carbon tax. It'll be the end of our sheep industry. I don't think your working mothers are going to be very happy when they're paying over $100 for a roast. But prices haven't risen to the predicted heights. Prime Minister, how much less will this leg of lamb cost by the end of this week? <laughs> Oh yes, they all had a good laugh that day. And look, us climate sceptics should admit we got it wrong on that one. We thought that so-called climate action meant meat would be more expensive. It turns out that it actually means we'll miss out on meat altogether. Or at least, you know, we'll have to deal with rationing or something like that. Now let me tell you something. It will be a cold day in hell before I trade in my delicious natural steak for some disgusting lab-grown plant-based cut of fake meat made out of God knows what. I'd rather be dead. And I do mean that literally. I would literally prefer to die than live in a world without good food. But that is the exact hell that the climate lobbies have in store for us if they get their way. Now, they denied, of course, last week after Joe Biden's farcical Zoom conference on climate, the usual suspects were out in force saying that talk of less red meat was just more disinformation. Oh, no, 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 no. Our plans to radically and undemocratically change our society by taxing an element of the periodic table, that won't affect you at all. No, 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 just, now just shut up and listen to the science. They are lying. How do we know they're lying? Well, firstly, because these very same people are off at Davos half the time dreaming up ways to end terrible hate crimes like Wagyu oyster blades and the double quarter pounder with cheese. But we also know they're lying because we at the IPA have done the research on it ourselves. Just a couple of years ago, we released research in which my colleague, the IPA's Director of Research and all-round patriot Daniel Wild, found that when it comes to Australia's commitments under the Paris Agreement alone, leaving aside net zero, fiddling around with the energy market alone will not get us there to our Paris targets. Why? Because energy only accounts for around a third of our emissions to begin with. To get to Paris targets, you need to cut emissions in other areas like agriculture. That's right, kids. Climate justice isn't all windmills and bike lanes. If the climate lobby get their way, the Australian way of life will radically change. Because climate action and climate change isn't about the environment or pollution or the temperature of the earth. It's about control and it's about woke ideology. I mean, take a look at this speaker at the big Zoom meeting that Biden had and ask yourself what relevance any of this has to anything. The climate crisis is the result of those perpetuating and upholding the, the harmful systems of colonialism, oppression, capitalism, and market-oriented greenwash solutions. We demand comprehensive, non-Eurocentric, and intersectional climate education, including literacy on climate justice, environmental racism, ancestral and indigenous wisdom, on historical movements, disability justice, green careers, and sustainable living. Oh, and by the way, this is how the sitting U.S. Secretary of State introduced this lunatic. Xie, thank you. Thank you for all you've done to leave everything better than you found it. We're humbled and inspired by your service. And now we look forward to hearing from you. Now, how did we get here? How did all this happen? How did this idiotic doomsday cult get the endorsement of just about every leader in the Western world? Well, as you'd expect, it all started with Al Gore. He didn't just make a post-politics career and millions and millions of dollars out of climate change hysteria. Arguably, he invented it. And in flat white this week, two Spectator Australia heavyweights have told the fascinating story of how it all happened. So let's hear it now. Joining me are Spectator contributors John Ruddick and Professor Ian Plymer. Gentlemen, how are you? G'day, Gideon. Thanks so much for having me you on your show. I'm loving this show, so I'm pleased to see it's been such a success. Very well indeed. Enjoying sunny, warm, broken hill. Excellent. Now, to you, John, uh, to talk us through this piece, Al Gore started this whole thing. It really, yes. Al Gore was patient zero in the climate uh, hysteria pandemic. Talk us through how that happened. Okay, well, look, I have a confession to make first up, Gideon, and that is since 1999, I have suffered from a rare but acute health condition, which is the Al Gore obsession syndrome. <laughs> now, since 1999, I have been keeping a very, very close eye on this guy because I picked him. I thought that this guy has unusually talented political drive, mm. not scientific drive. Okay, now, I, I think we can say in the year 2021, the most influential person this century so far is 
Albert Gore. Yep. You can go to Zambia or Bulgaria or Belize and you go to the newspaper and they are talking about global warming. Okay. Now, Ian and I have written this piece for The Spectator Online. Rowan said he wanted to get it into the magazine. He said, but it can't, you've got to halve it in length. We said, we cannot. <laughs> this this 2,000 word piece, it has to stay at 2,000. So it's online. Now, we want everybody to read it because 30 years ago this month was the most entertaining and the most damning chapter in Al Gore's career. Mm. It needs to get more publicity and it tells us that Al Gore knows that it's a fiction. He's well aware of it. Now, what had happened is Gore ran for, the, the very quick summary is this, Gore ran for president in 1988 in the Democratic primary. He would have been the youngest president in history had he won. He was the last of the Southern conservative Democrats. Mm. He was uh, pro-gun, pro-tobacco, anti-gay, anti-abortion and pro-Jesus. And the Democratic Party had changed and he, he humiliated himself in that primary. So then within a few months of him losing that, and he's still determined to be president, he needs a new cause. So he says, there's this little thing called global war with it's been bubbling along a little bit in the academic world. And I did take one course at Harvard with this guy called Roger Revell. The, the article that Ian and I've written is about Roger Revell, who is the grandfather of global warming and who is, despite global warming being highly partisan, Everybody agrees Roger Revelle is a very credible guy because he had been studying the data since the 1950s and he was the first to say, well, I wonder if all this extra CO2 is uh, overcooking the planet. Now, that was he, it was a theory for him. And as time went on, Roger Revelle's uh, confidence in the theory reduced. Mm. But then when Al Gore needed a new cause, he told the world, he said, oh, everybody, everybody, I have found this cause. I'm... I'm telling the world what Roger Revelle has been saying. And that made Gore famous and mm. it made the Democratic Party love him again. But then Roger Revelle, about two years into this, this is about 1990, wrote this lengthy piece and he said, look, I don't like all this alarmism. I'm very concerned about it. And then he sadly passed away from a heart attack three months later. And Gore then furiously spent, uh, tried to manipulate and to try to delete what Roger Revelle has said. To this day, mm. Gore still says, I'm just repeating what, what Roger Revelle says, because obviously Gore has no science standing, so he has to rely on somebody else. So that's the summary of it. It's all political, and he knows that it's based on a falsehood. So that's the politics of it. Now, Ian, to you as uh, somebody who's you know very accomplished in this area, who is an authority in this area, once and for all, what is the link between anthropogenic carbon dioxide and the temperature of the planet? Well, just to add to what John said, there's a couple of things we didn't write. Uh, the Gore family owned zinc smelters that uh, treated the ore from the tri-state region, that's Mississippi, Kentucky and Illinois. Now, these zinc smelters used masses of energy. They were greatly polluting. They put out huge amounts of carbon dioxide. We never hear about that from mm. Mr Gore. And I know that because I'm recording this from Broken Hill and we used to send some of our zinc uh, concentrates every now and then to the tri-state, to the, to the Gore's own smelter. <laughs> Here's a person who's attacking energy, yet he's made his first great tranche of money out of smelting, which uses a lot of energy. The science is very simple. You have to be able to prove that human emissions of carbon dioxide drive global warming. That has never been done. Now, if you could prove that human emissions of carbon dioxide drove global warming, then you'd have to prove that the 97% of emissions, which mainly come from the oceans, but all volcanoes, etc., that the 97% of natural emissions do not drive global warming. So you've got two impossible tasks right away. So the science is flawed. Mm. And from that flawed science, which constantly gets ignored, we've created this massive juggernaut, which is almost impossible to stop. One day, and I hope it's John and I, one day someone's going to loosen the lock washers on the wheels and it's just all going to fall apart and it's going to be very ugly. In the meantime, we are paying trillions of dollars for this new yep. Dutch tulip craze. And these trillions of dollars are being paid for 
in the first world countries, in the wealthy countries, because we can afford to be stupid. We can afford to go out and buy the latest tulip, which is more than a year's salary. The third world doesn't care. China is going flat out, yep. building coal-fired power stations, putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and then talking to the West, saying, you people have got to do more to have wind and to have solar. In other words, we can send you more wind and solar um, turbines and solar panels. So this is probably the greatest scientific con we've ever seen in the history of the planet. And Mr Gore is the only person who is a multi-billionaire from frightening us witless about climate change. Because climate always changes. What's there to be frightened about? <laughs> We've got far more important things to be frightened about, like stupidity yeah. or the herd mentality. Now, fast forward in the Gore narrative, he gets into the White House in 1993 on Bill Clinton's coattails, carrying with him this crazy theory of uh, global warming. How then does it get out of hand from there? Gore rehabilitated. After the embarrassment of 88, he's rehabilitated himself purely because of global warming but, and lefties have short memories. And remember, this is the era when communism is collapsing and so the left needed a new course. So Gore gave it. Gore dished it up. Here it is, global warming. The left said, we love it. We love it. So And it, it rehabilitated him so much. Candidate Clinton said, would you like to be my vice president? Of course, he says yes. And it was Gore had been preaching all this fire and brimstone. Now, then what happened about a year, we go into this in the article, about a year later, there was a libel case which exposed how Gore had been trying to distort and manipulate what Roger Revelle had said. It massively blew up in Gore's face. And, th and there was talk that Gore would have to be dropped. He was such a political time bomb because of all the global warming stuff. So the interesting thing is it, this, from about 1994, to about 2006, which coincides with when it suits Gore, global warming was very much on the back, back foot. So when Gore runs for president in 2000, he's the Democratic nominee, mm. he gets up for about an hour and a half and he uh, accepts the party's nomination. Now, Gore was criticised in that campaign for being a policy wonk. And, and in that speech, it's just non-stop, hardcore policy. Poor little global warming only gets about five seconds. Yeah. And he caught <laughs> because by this stage it doesn't help him politically. Mm. Gore and Gore said, Gore said that it was a, a silent threat in 2000. Okay. Well, where's the fire and brimstone gone from? Okay. Now then he then of course he loses the election under very controversial circumstances. And Gore walks around like he's this martyr. Mm. And half of America, liberal America, just think this guy can't do anything wrong. Whatever he says, we're gonna lap it up. And then Gore was quite quiet for about six years, but he was planning the second revolution, the second, the great, the resurrection of global warming. It had saved him once, and by God, it had saved him again. Yep. Now, by this stage, there was no criticism. Gore was like Mandela or yeah. Gandhi. And so whatever he says, he says, and so, and, and every, look, everyone knows that um, Donald Trump was hated by uh, the left in America. Uh, and it overshadowed how much they hated George W. Bush. Yep. But we can't forget that they really did hate George Bush a lot. They hated Trump more than three times more, but they hated George W. Bush, and the ringleader in all that was Gore. So then he comes out with a new book, An Inconvenient Truth, where he ramps up how much how close he was to him and Roger Revelle. And, and uh, he comes out with the movie, the Academy Award, the Nobel Prize, and so then just governments all across the world, because the American media went along with it, and then Obama wins, and he says, oh, yeah, I love everything Al Gore is saying, and it's just it's just become this, as, as Ian said, it's just, just this, this fiction that doesn't seem to stop growing. But the interesting thing is this. They, keep, they can't help making predictions. They've been doing it since the 80s, and not one has come true. Yeah. Because of that, they're now blending into global warming all these other things, racism, income inequality, yep. that's because the science has collapsed. Yep. And But they don't, they don't want the gravy chain to collapse, so they've got to add in all these new ingredients just to yeah. and, and simple minds are going along with it. That's the thing. It's now morphed into from climate change and climate action to climate justice. I mean, it's just this perennial Rorschach test in which the political left see whatever they want in this amorphous climate issue. But, you know, that, that, again, that's the politics. But to Ian, again... Um, you, you mentioned very succinctly and very correctly that there hasn't been a definitive link ever proven. So why have we fallen under this 
terrible talking point that the science is settled. How can the scientific community be so close-minded on this issue, if nothing else? Well, I think there's a number of issues here. The scientific community lives off the taxpayer. They live off government grants. And you see that quite often when people retire from being an active scientist in a government or in an institution, all of a sudden they discover honesty. And they start to say, well, you know, I'm not so sure the evidence is that strong. We've just seen this recently. This is not at all uncommon. So it's a wonderful thing to frighten people with because it's a silent threat, as John said. And we are frightened of things we can't see. We're hardwired to whistle in the dark. We're hardwired to look over our shoulder. So we're frightened of radiation. We can't see it, Mm. but we can measure it. We're frightened of a virus. We can't see it, but we can measure it. And we can't see carbon dioxide, but we can measure it. And this is a mechanism whereby unelected bureaucrats and their political masters, or I suspect followers, uh, can keep a community permanently frightened and the community can say, oh, thank you for saving me from climate change. Here, have some more money. And we've got to get this into perspective. Mm. The atmosphere used to have about 20% carbon dioxide in it. During that time, we had some of the biggest ice ages we've ever seen on planet Earth. We've had six big ice ages. Six out of the six started when we had more carbon dioxide in the air than now. We've taken that carbon dioxide out of the air, sequestered it into dolomite, which has got 48% carbon dioxide in it, and limestone, which has got 44% carbon dioxide. If we halved the atmospheric carbon dioxide content, all plants would die. Mm. All animals would die because Mm. there's no plants. So we have only, for 500 million years, been pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. It is now a trace gas. Mm. It's 0.04%. When we breathe out, it's over 4% that we breathe out. So if you want to have net zero emissions, simple solution, stop breathing. And and you can lead by example. Now, we have only measurements (laughs) made by narrow atmospheric scientists and they measure the physics of the atmosphere. Mm. They don't measure what is beneath the atmosphere Mm. and that is what's happening on the floor of the ocean. We have submarine volcanoes that pump out massive amounts of heat and huge amounts of carbon dioxide, and there was only a paper out on that this week. They heat the ocean. They can change the weather and perhaps change the climate. And there's some very, very good interactions between volcanology and climate. But if you're out there scaring people witless and creating models, which, as John says, we've got 30 years of modelling, mm. not one of the 117 major models has worked, and if we play these models backwards, none of them can predict what we have measured. So the whole scare is based on models, which people don't understand. It's based on science, which people don't understand. And science is not done by consensus. Science is not done by committees. The only committee, I would argue, that's done anything that stood the test of time is the Committee of Scholars that translated the Bible into the King James Edition. No other committee, no other group has ever worked on a consensus. Great scientific discoveries have been made by people working in isolation or working out of the mainstream. Mm. And um, science advances, well, Karl Popper would say science advances by refutation. I argue that science advances one funeral at a time. (laughs) I see it in my own discipline. And when I shuffle off, people are going to say, oh, thank God he's gone. (laughs) (laughs) And people will evolve into something else. So the whole business is a wonderful business because that's what it is for Al Gore. Mm -hmm. It's a business dealing with a trace gas that you can neither smell nor taste. You can't see it. This trace gas, um, oh, you know, people don't understand. It's the food of life. So people have no knowledge of science. They have no knowledge of how models work. They have no knowledge of mathematics. It's the perfect storm. Mm. You can con people, and this is what's been happening, both scientifically where scientists have a very, very comfortable life by getting massive research grants and special climate institutes set up, and politicians who we thank with our vote. 
because mm. we were frightened and they have saved us. Well, on this show, uh, we stand for, you know, the real spirit of science, the real scientific methods, not the science, but science and the search for truth. And uh, well done to both of you on a sensational and very, very important and I must say very entertaining article as well, an absolute must read. And I'm sure I'll have reason to speak to both of you about this issue again and again and again and again. Uh, so uh, thanks, Jensen. I'll see you soon. Thank you, Gideon. And thank you, co-author.